From New York, this is Democracy Now! It's like we're against all odds in this world. My dad got executed just by trying to save his own life. You know, he was not in no, the, the officers was not in no harm of him at all. Andrew Brown was executed. That's the message from his family members who've been shown a 20-second snippet of police body cam footage showing Brown was shot in the head while his hands were on the steering wheel in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Seven sheriff's deputies have been placed on leave. Three others have resigned or retired. We'll speak with the Reverend William Barber. It happened to a man. It happened to a father of seven. It happened to a cousin, to a nephew. He's not a caricature. That's He's right. a man. That's yes. right. Yes. A young 42-year-old black man. Yes. Say his name. Andrew Brown. Then we go to Philadelphia to look at a shocking report about how two Ivy League schools, the University of Pennsylvania and Princeton, have been using the bones of a child killed in 1985 when the Philadelphia police bombed the home of the radical black group MOVE, killing 11 people, including five children. Not only did they kill my children, kill my sisters and brothers, but they have desecrated what they say are their remains. We will speak to MOVE member Mike Africa, Jr. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Hundreds of demonstrators took to the streets of Elizabeth City, North Carolina, Monday, for a fifth day to protest last week's police killing of Andrew Brown, Jr., a 42-year-old black father. On Monday, authorities allowed Brown's family and attorney to watch a 20-second video clip of the shooting. The family says it shows Andrew Brown was shot in the back of the head while his hands were on the steering wheel of a car. This is Brown family attorney Chantel Cherry Lassiter. Andrew had his hands on his steering wheel. Mm -hmm. He was not reaching for anything. He wasn't touching anything. He wasn't throwing anything around. He had his hands firmly on the steering wheel. They run up to his vehicle shooting. Oh. Oh. He still stood there, sat there in his vehicle with his hands on the steering wheel while being shot at. Yeah. <laughs> now, keep in mind, this is 20 seconds. I have three pages of notes for 20 seconds. We watched this over and over and over to make sure we were clear at what was being going on and what was transpiring. After headlines, we'll go to North Carolina to speak with North Carolina Reverend William Barber. The Justice Department has launched a probe into the Louisville, Kentucky Metropolitan Police Department over whether officers have a pattern or practice of using unreasonable force, including against peaceful protesters. Attorney General Merrick Garland announced the civil investigation Monday. It will determine whether LMPD engages in unconstitutional stops, searches and seizures, as well as whether the department unlawfully executes search warrants on private homes. The probe will also investigate the Louisville-Jefferson County Metropolitan Government. It comes 13 months after plainclothes officers serving a no-knock warrant busted through the door of Breonna Taylor's home in the middle of the night and shot her dead. She was a black 26-year-old emergency medical technician and aspiring nurse. Former officer Brett Hankison was indicted on charges of wanton endangerment for shooting into the apartment of a neighbor, but no one's been criminally charged over Breonna Taylor's killing. The COVID-19 pandemic has reached a new record high, with the number of daily global infections now averaging more than 820,000, led by a massive outbreak in India. The WHO says the pandemic is still in its acute phase, with a ninth straight week of rising infections. Almost 5.7 million cases were reported last week alone, which the World Health Organization says is certain to be an underestimate. This is the WHO's director general, Tedros Many countries are still experiencing intense transmission, and the situation in India is beyond heartbreaking. 
On Monday, President Joe Biden spoke by phone with Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi, promising to send aid, including vaccination supplies, therapeutic drugs and desperately needed oxygen. This comes after India's government ordered Twitter, Facebook and Instagram to censor about 100 social media posts criticizing Prime Minister Modi's disastrous handling of the pandemic. The Biden administration said Monday it would share up to 60 million doses of the U.S.-manufactured AstraZeneca vaccine with other nations. That's enough for 30 million people, about 0.4 percent of the world's population. The AstraZeneca vaccine is not approved for use in the United States. President Biden is signing an executive order today, establishing a $15-an-hour minimum wage for federal contractors. Biden will also eliminate a lower tipped minimum wage for certain federal contractors who receive tips. Meanwhile, the White House is preparing to propose an increase in the capital gains task to help pay for his upcoming American Families Plan. The proposal calls for increased federal spending on child care, pre-K, paid family leave and tuition-free community college. Brian Dees, director of the National Economic Council, said the capital gains tax increase will target only the very wealthiest Americans. This change will only apply to three-tenths of a percent of taxpayers, um, which is not the top one percent. Uh, it's not even the top one half of one percent. Uh, we're talking about three-tenths of a percent. That's about 500,000 households uh, in the country that we're talking about. On Wednesday, President Biden will speak to a joint session of Congress for the first time, a ceremony that was delayed from February due to the coronavirus pandemic. The Supreme Court said Monday it'll hear a case on whether New York's restrictions on concealed carry firearms licenses violate the Second Amendment. The National Rifle Association backed the challenge. Justices will hear oral arguments this fall, with a decision expected sometime next year. The Supreme Court has also agreed to hear a case brought by a Guantanamo Bay prisoner who was tortured in U.S. custody. Abu Zubaida and his lawyer want to subpoena former CIA contractors James Mitchell and Bruce Jackson about their role in developing torture tactics employed at a secret CIA black site in Poland where Zubaida was imprisoned. The U.S. Census Bureau has released the results of its 2020 census, showing the U.S. population grew at its slowest pace since the 30s. The results will reshape political power in the House of Representatives, where Texas will gain two seats. Meanwhile, North Carolina, Florida, Colorado, Oregon and Montana will each gain one congressional seat. New York's congressional delegation will shrink by one member after coming up short by a mere 89 people. Also losing a House seat are Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Ohio, Michigan, Illinois and California. Florida voting rights advocates are sounding the alarm over new legislation that would make it harder to vote by mail, among other restrictions critics are condemning as Jim Crow 2.0. The bill, approved by Florida's state Senate Monday, would also limit ballot drop boxes, impose more identification requirements for absentee ballots, and criminalize giving food and water to voters waiting in line. The legislation is similar to a recent sweeping voter suppression law enacted in Georgia. In Arizona, Republican officials are continuing to challenge the result of the presidential election and have hired the Florida-based company Cyber Ninjas to assist in the audit of millions of ballots in Maricopa County, Arizona's most populous region. Cyber Ninja is run by a man whose widely shared conspiracy theories that claim the 2020 election was illegitimate. The audit was approved by the Arizona State Senate, which used its subpoena power to take possession of 2.1 million ballots, ballot counting machines machines and computer hard drives. Former President Trump praised Arizona Republicans in a statement and said, quote, I predict the results will be startling. Arizona's Democratic Secretary of State called the efforts a farce as election officials warn the move will severely damage people's faith in the democratic process. California Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom could face a special recall election after a Republican-led effort gained enough signatures to qualify for the ballot. If the recall petition is certified, voters will decide by the end of the year whether to remove Newsom from office. Newsom's advisers predicted he would beat back the recall, calling it the work of pro-Trump, anti-mask, anti-vaccine extremists, they said. 
Oklahoma's Republican Governor Kevin Stitt has signed several bills that would make abortions almost completely illegal statewide. One bill would revoke the medical license of any Oklahoma doctor who performs an abortion except in very rare circumstances. Another bill bans abortions around six weeks of pregnancy, and a third requires doctors who perform abortions be board certified in obstetrics and gynecology. The legislation will face immediate legal challenges. Israel's security cabinet has approved a major military escalation in the Gaza Strip if Palestinian fighters don't stop firing rockets into southern Israel. Israel also moved Monday to completely cut off Palestinians' access to a fishing zone off the coast of the Gaza Strip. This comes, as Human Rights Watch said for the first time, Israel's committing the crimes of apartheid and persecution in the occupied Palestinian territories. In a report and accompanying video released today, Human Rights Watch said that Israeli authorities have dispossessed, confined, forcibly separated and subjugated Palestinians by virtue of their identity. Israeli authorities maintain a two-tier system which privileges Jewish Israelis over Palestinians. The means used by Israeli authorities in the occupied territory amount to the systematic oppression needed to establish the crime of apartheid. Israeli authorities have committed a range of abuses against Palestinians. In the occupied territory, those abuses include mass land confiscation, the denial of residency rights and the suspension of civil rights, and rise to the threshold of inhumane acts and severe abuses of the fundamental rights of Palestinians. The U.S. government has agreed to train Guatemalan border agents as part of the Biden administration's efforts to further militarize Central American borders, make it more difficult for asylum seekers to reach the U.S.-Mexico border. The U.S. will reportedly send over a dozen Homeland Security agents to Guatemala. This isn't the first time U.S. authorities have been deployed to Guatemala to train local law enforcement. The offer came during a virtual meeting between Vice President Kamala Harris and the Guatemalan president, Alejandro Giamate. And we want to work with you to address both the acute causes as well as the root causes in a way that will bring hope to the people of Guatemala that there will be an opportunity for them if they stay at home. Central American and immigrant justice advocates have widely condemned more U.S. intervention in the region, saying U.S. foreign policies have exacerbated poverty, violence and other root causes of why people have to flee in the first place. In Tijuana, Mexico, asylum seekers led a protest over the weekend, demanding they be allowed to enter the United States and seek refuge. Dozens of people peacefully marched to the San Isidro port of entry, while U.S. authorities responded by shutting down the border for hours and unleashing police and riot gear. Hundreds of asylum seekers have been stuck in Tijuana, living in a makeshift border camp since February. This is an asylum seeker from Honduras addressing President Biden. We want them to answer us, to listen to us for five minutes, have compassion. There are children here, and he, Joe Biden, was also a child. Let them see that we suffer. He has not suffered, but we have. We were not born rich. We were born in poverty. We are poor, hardworking, and honest. We want them to listen to us and open the door for us. And in Lavaca Bay, Texas. For 72-year-old environmental activist and author Diane Wilson is entering her 21st day on hunger strike today, demanding the Biden administration stop the dredging of the Matagorda ship channel and the construction of a new crude oil export terminal proposed by oil company Max Midstream. Wilson says she fears the dredging could release mercury contamination, devastating fisheries and local communities. Last weekend, over a dozen activists and kayaks joined Wilson for a protest against the proposed oil project. Wilson is a fourth-generation fisherwoman from the Texas Gulf Coast. In 2019, she won a $50 million lawsuit against plastic giant Formosa, the largest settlement of its type in U.S. history. Nearly half the funds have already been used to create a sustainable fishery cooperative and cleanup efforts in the region. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. When we come back, we'll talk to the Reverend William Barber about last week's police killing of Andrew Brown in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. Stay with us.
Freak Victim by Emdo Mokhtar. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York City, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, hundreds of demonstrators have taken to the streets of Elizabeth City, North Carolina, for a fifth day to protest last week's police killing of Andrew Brown, a 42-year-old black father. On Monday, authorities allowed Brown's family and attorneys to watch a 20-second video clip of the shooting. The family says it shows Andrew Brown was shot in the back of the head while his hands were on the steering wheel of his car. His son, Khalil Faraby, Describe the shooting as an execution. It's like we're against all odds in this world. My dad got executed just by trying to save his own life. You know, he was not in no—the the officers was not in no harm of him at all. It's just messed up how this happened, man. For real. Execution. For real. He got executed. It ain't right. It ain't right at all. Chantelle Cherry Lassiter, an attorney for Andrew Brown's family, described what she saw in the 20-second snippet. Andrew Brown was in his driveway. Mm -hmm. The sheriff uh, truck blocked him in his driveway, so he could not exit his driveway. Andrew had his hands on his steering wheel. Mm -hmm. He was not reaching for anything. He wasn't touching anything. He wasn't throwing anything around. He had his hands firmly on the steering wheel. They run up to his vehicle shooting. He still stood there, sat there in his vehicle with his hands on the steering wheel while being shot at. (laughs) Now, keep in mind, this is 20 seconds. I have three pages of notes for 20 seconds. We watched this over and over and over to make sure we were clear at what was going on and what was transpiring. Attorney Ben Crump, who's also representing Andrew Brown's family, called on authorities to publicly release all body cam footage. We want to say on the record, from the onset, we do not feel that we got transparency. We only saw a snippet of the video. When we know that the video started before— and after right. what they showed the family. Uh-huh. And they determined what was pertinent. Wow. Huh. Why couldn't the family see all the video? Right. They only showed one body cam video, mm-hmm. even though we know there were several That's body right. cam videos if they were following the law and the policy in this county that everybody has video cameras on their uniforms. Andrew Brown was shot dead April 21st, while the county sheriff's office was attempting to serve him an arrest warrant on drug charges. Officials in Elizabeth City have already declared a state of emergency ahead of the public release of the body cam footage, warning it could result in a period of civil unrest. At least eight officers were at the scene of the shooting. Seven sheriff's deputies have already been placed on paid administrative leave. Two other deputies have resigned, and another retired over the past week. This is attorney Bakari Sellers, who's also representing the Brown family. Only in this country can you have the trial of Derek Chauvin be interrupted by the death of Dante Wright, be interrupted by the death of Adam Toledo, be interrupted by the death of Micaiah Bryant, and now we find ourselves here in Elizabeth City. The Reverend William Barber was also there yesterday. On Saturday, um, Reverend Barber of the Poor People's Campaign traveled to Elizabeth City to meet with the family of Andrew Brown. It happened to a man. It happened to a father of seven. It happened to a cousin, to a nephew. He's not a caricature. Mm-hmm. He's a man. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yes. A young 42 year old black man. Yes. Say his name. Andrew Brown. 
The Reverend William Barber joins us now, co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, president of Repairers of the Breach. Welcome back to Democracy Now!, Reverend. Let's begin with yesterday. What a scene unfolded. Um, as the family had been promised, at 11.30 in the morning, they'd been sh shown unedited video of what happened to Andrew Brown. It went on. They waited for hour after hour. And then they go inside, and they're shown a 20-second snippet. Can you explain what took place? You were there, outside, um, what they saw, and what you're demanding. Well, thank you so much, Amy. And, um, you know, we have three powerful attorneys that are representing the family, uh, uh, Harry Daniels, uh, who's representing the uh, one of the mothers and five siblings. People ought to know there are five uh, minor children and two uh, grown children. Uh, and he's also representing one of the aunts. And then you have uh, attorney Ben Crump and Bakari Sellers representing the older children. And, and, uh, and they all combined and working together. Um, you, let me set a context, Amy, and that is the sheriff and the DA, and we need to start saying the DA, because the county uh, lawyer is not the DA. The sheriff and the DA could have gotten all of this done within an hour or so. The law simply says a judge has to do it, and all it would have needed is the sheriff and the DA, or the DA alone could have gone to the, the, the judge and said, this needs to be released. And we're in the context of when something happened like this in Columbus, it was released, Columbus, Ohio, it was released almost immediately. And the same thing could happen in North Carolina, this would have been one extra step. Uh, when we went there, uh, this young man, 42 years old, and by the way, never had, no gun was found, no drugs were found, and this boy has no history of any kind of violence uh, or violence on his record. Uh, the, the, they had been promised, we had been promised to see the tape. I was there. They, they didn't even let all the family in. They didn't let some of the aunts in. They literally closed the door and wouldn't let them in. And yesterday represented 120 hours, 120 hours since this murder. Uh, and in fact, I want to mention to you that this is the second one on the East Coast since and during the Children trial. There's another one called Donovan Lynch in Virginia Beach, who was also shot. And in his instance, there were no body cameras. They cut, they cut the cameras off. So now we have Andrew Brown. They got, they waited 120 hours to get 20 seconds. 120 hours to get 20 seconds. That is absolutely ridiculous. We also learned on Saturday, because one of the local reporters asked us in our press, in the press conference, what did we think about them using a SWAT-like team to go get this one person that they allegedly had a warrant for. And you know, a warrant is not a license to kill. A warrant doesn't mean you get executed on the spot. A warrant doesn't mean you're guilty. Uh, and there's no, the, the Supreme Court has said, if you flee, it is not illegal that people don't have a right to shoot you in the back. And we know from the audio reports, he was shot in the back. The back of and, the head. And, and the back of the head, that's right. And, and we don't know how many shots. You know, today there's gonna be an independent autopsy that will be uh, actually released. But um, uh, 20 seconds after 120 hours, uh, that is absolutely unacceptable. And they were promised that they would be able to see it. Now, one last thing. They said they needed to redact the film. Now, this is the people that are supposed to be doing the investigation. You know, in national security matters, you redact. But this, the national security here is they haven't shown the tapes. And, and, they, and the family wasn't even asking that they see the, they, the whole public. They were saying, can we and our lawyers see this? And they said, no, we have to redact the tape. We've got to do certain things with the tape. Well, and, 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 and this is problematic. The last thing you should know is the DA there could, he could, have, could have asked the, the state attorney general to come take this over because they bungled it and fumbled it. He could easily say, I want the state attorney general. And you have to know in North Carolina, the state attorney general can't just take it over. The, the, the law says the local DA must ask. And, and, and today we're meeting with pastors, the North Carolina NAACP repairs of the breach, the AME Zion Church, the North Carolina Council of Churches. We're meeting with uh, the, some of the lawyers, and afterwards we're going to announce and declare a moral emergency 
uh, and a justice emergency. There's no real emergency in the city. There's been no, no violence. It's all been peaceful and everything. So the real emergency here is a moral emergency and a, and a judicial emergency. Barbara, I wanted to ask you, you mentioned that the autopsy results will be uh, available soon, but this issue of the number of shots fired, the police know that, they knew that immediately. They could have at least said uh, this number of shells were spent by all of the officers on the scene. It seems to me, especially given the fact that we are, we're hearing that two officers have already resigned and one retired, that that clearly is a signal when some police are leaving immediately before even any investigation is through, that this is a, a horrendous shooting. Uh, your thoughts about this whole issue of not even giving information on the number of bullets fired? And also, what is there a role for the governor here uh, to step in in some way or other on this case? Yeah. The governor has already said that, that, that the tape should be released. And so has the state attorney general, the tape should be released. You know, North Carolina does not make his body cam automatic public record. Now, that bill is sitting in the General Assembly right now, and the Republican legislature has blocked it, and um, and even uh, some of the police associations have fought against it. But it could be passed in 20 seconds right now if they, they wanted to do that. Uh, but you're exactly right in terms of things that could have been done immediately. We could have known how exactly how many officers went and why that many officers went. We could know what kind of team went. Was this just sheriffs? Was this some kind of SWAT team? We could know what kind of weapons they used. Was it pistols? Was it assault rifles? And we should be able to know exactly how many shots were fired. All of those things could have been done um, almost immediately, uh, or at least within the first day. And none of that has, has taken place. You know, this is one of the reasons why um, we have to challenge this issue. I was looking at a report from News One uh, done uh, last year, I believe, and it showed how there were these eight white uh, uh, killers, some of them mass murderers, uh, like Dalen Roof, uh, who was arrested and some say even got a hamburger. But all of these persons were, were white. They were arrested. Some of them resisted arrest. They killed people. All of them were arrested. None of them ended up dead. But too often we hear about black men being shot in the back or black women being shot in their beds uh, by these police. And what we say is that, it, and it doesn't matter if even if some of the cops were black, uh, that doesn't matter. Uh, the fact of the matter is a, 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 a gun and a badge and the ability to take a piece of paper and, and extract your loved one from the, your home or wherever they are is too much power for a bigot and for a trigger-happy uh, officer that, that, kills, can, that can literally kill people in my name because they get their power from the state. That's also why, Amy and, and why we need federal laws. You know, what we really need is when and if police murder or execute someone, and, that's, and, it's, and, and we know that we need accountability, we need arrest, we need prosecution without immunity, we need the appropriate prison time. And I be, and some of us are beginning to say we need payment. And it doesn't all need to come from an insurance company that's paid for by the taxpayers. Uh, it needs to come out of these people's pensions and from these police departments. And then we need pattern and practice investigations. You know, this is Eastern North Carolina. There's a long history of this. My father, uh, I was raised here in this area. My, and, and I'm about just a few miles from where I live. Um, is Elizabeth City. It's the home of Elizabeth City State University. It's the black belt of North Carolina. It's where slave patrols used to chase down black people heavily because this is where the most of the slavery was uh, in, in North Carolina. Uh, I can remember in the 1970s, my father was fighting against uh, police in, in the eastern North Carolina uh, and a sheriff in another county who almost made it a habit to shoot somebody every so often who was African American. So there's a, there's a lot of, of, of undercover things that are going on here. This is the same Eastern North Carolina, where in the last few years, uh, we helped uh, two, when was it, one, two, three African American men who were put in jail for murder, uh, only to be found that they were not guilty and released after 20 and 22 years in jail. And even a young man over in Wilson, which is in eastern North Carolina, 
uh, that was put in jail and was, was, was threatened with life imprisonment only to find out he didn't do the killing. So this is eastern North Carolina. This is the South. And that's why we must pay a lot of attention to this and understand what's going on here. Uh, because it, this case is about Andrew Brown. It's about the South. And it could break open some things in the South because some of the most horrendous laws, the most restrictive laws when it comes to policing, some of the most egregious things that have happened down through the years have happened in these southern small rural counties uh, across America. And I'm wondering, Reverend Barber, in the wake of the guilty verdict for Derek Chauvin and after now nearly a year of massive protests all around the country uh, in, in terms of uh, Black Lives Matter, your sense of these these killings continue to happen as if these uh, police departments are not heeding or listening uh, to the massive outcry in the not only in the African American community but among people of color and people of goodwill everywhere. You, your thoughts about what's happening right now in terms of law enforcement in the country? Well, it makes everybody unsafe. I mean, you look at these marches, even in eastern North Carolina, they're mixed, black and white and brown and native and Asian, and gay and straight and young and old. I mean, that's one of the things. People understand that rogue cops or a systemic problem within policing uh, makes us all unsafe uh, when you don't have any transparency and trust. And we're all in tremendous danger. Uh, it is a, a violation not only of humanity, it's a violation of fundamental uh, constitutional uh, rights, and it is very dangerous. As I said, I'm a nonviolent person. I, I practice nonviolent. But I, the only person I know that can come to my door with a piece of paper and take my wife, my children out, and or someone I love, from, and, and, and just take them, and I don't resist and don't say, no, you can't have them, is an officer of the law. That's the only person that I'll say, uh, to my to my loved ones, I'll see you downtown. That is too much power, uh, and 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 we've got to get in. That's why we have to have these federal laws. But we've got we can't have one standard in one county with one DA and and one sheriff, and then another standard in another county, and then another standard in another county. And I will tell you what people are saying. You know, uh, even my sons, they said, Daddy, it almost looks like and feels like. Uh, Chauvin gets uh, arrested and gets prosecuted, and and there's an increase, uh, you know, uh, like we're going to get them now. Now that can't be proven, but people feel like that. Say, what is going on? The 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 more these officers get exposed. Uh, it seems like they're getting more reckless. I, I want and Reverend to take... Barber, just making that point, you have Chauvin verdict comes down last Tuesday, on Wednesday. Two men are shot. I, I mean, it, <clears throat> for people who are confused, you have Anthony Brown in North Carolina. He is shot dead by sheriff's deputies. Okay. On the same day in Virginia, a black man was hospitalized after he was shot by sheriff's deputy who responded to a 911 call less than an hour earlier. The same sheriff's deputy drove that same man, Isaiah Brown, not Anthony Brown, Isaiah Brown, home after Brown's car broke down. Isaiah Brown was unarmed, was holding a cordless phone in his hand when the officer fired seven shots at him. Brown's family said he was on the line with the police, with 911, when he was shot. Can you comment yeah. on this? And then finally, this demand for the— George Floyd Police Accountability Act. Yeah, yeah. Well, think that you're exactly right, and you ha and, and and shot seven times. I want folk to hear the multiplicity of bullets. We're not talking about shot. You know, so one time is enough, but shot seven times. As we said, we don't know how many shots. Uh, they said the car was riddled with bullets with Andrew Brown, and then don't and don't forget in the midst of the Chauvin trial, you got Donovan Lynch who was shot. Uh, uh, in, 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 in Virginia Beach and killed, uh, and that case is, is, is being dealt with. And then we've had two uh, teenagers that were killed, all of this during and after the trial. I mean, this is a, 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 the pandemic of injustice and the pandemic of police brutality and violence, and, we, and it must be held accountable. I mean, a police person must be held accountable murder. And let's not forget in the South, when Walter Scott was shot in the back, 
It took federal uh, prosecution to get that particular office, Michael Slick, I believe. It took federal, but the state didn't even prosecute him. It took federal. And then let us not forget what it took to get chosen. It took millions of people marching. It took a nine-minute video by a young girl. It took uh, the, the attorney general. It took calling a prosecutor out of retirement. It took police turning on themselves. People who thought the Chauvin trial represented some fundamental shift are, are, are actually mistaken. That is one case, but that has not dealt with the systematic issues um, um, that, that, that we are addressing. And Amy, we must have this bill. Many of us are looking at it to see if it needs to be even stronger, because I'm going to tell you, one of the things that a lot of these people count on is to continue the immunity, but also they know that if, if they kill someone and they're tried in the state, and they get acquitted in the state, they can't be tried again. And you know, from the civil rights movement, oftentimes the Klan did things because they knew they weren't going to get found guilty at the local level. And, all, and if they got charged at the federal level, they only faced five years. We must make sure that these federal laws are of such that it's automatic that there's going to be prosecution and there will be a penalty of the, that, that, that meets what a penalty for murder ought to be. And there's not going to be any immunity, and there will be arrest. And we're going to have to have laws that say there will be independent prosecution, not these local prosecutors that are tied in with the police departments and those things. That's what has to happen. Uh, and, the, and, and I like what Garland is doing, the new attorney general. And it's going to have to happen not only in Louisville, not only in the Minneapolis, Minnesota, but it's going to have to happen in places like Elizabeth City and Pasqua Tank County and in the South. This is serious business. It is systemic. Uh, I don't care, even if Lindsey Graham says racism is not systemic. It's systemic in voting. It's systemic in health care, systemic in economic, and it's certainly systemic when it comes to police violence against people of color. Well, we want to thank you, Reverend Dr. William Barber, co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, president of Repairers of the Breach, longtime North Carolina reverend, as he continues to deal with what's happening in Elizabeth City, in Virginia, in Columbus, Ohio. And a correction, I said Anthony Brown. I meant Andrew Brown, the man who was killed in North Carolina. Micaiah Bryant, the 16-year-old was killed in Columbus, Ohio, the teenager uh, who was 16 years old, one year younger than the video, uh, than the young woman who um, uh, filmed uh, the murder of George Floyd. Micaiah Bryant was killed by police on the day that the Chauvin verdict came down. Then the next day, Andrew Brown was killed. Isaiah Brown was shot by police. And Donovan Lynch. Don't forget Donovan Lynch. You need to know about that case. Because in, the, in this fight, uh, Amy, we can't just be bothered when white cop kills a black person, even if it's a black person who shoots an unarmed a uh, black person, uh, and in Donovan Lynch's case, it was a black and a white officer. It does not matter. Police don't care what your color is. I don't care if you shoot somebody white, black, brown, native. If it's a bad shoot, it's a murder or an execution, that must be prosecuted. So call Donovan Lynch, call Andrew Brown, call um, uh, Micaiah, uh, 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 little Adam Toledo up in uh, Chicago. This is just too much, and we must unite. We must fight this, and we've got laws and standards. They got 20 seconds after 120 hours. 120 hours, they only got 20 to see 20 seconds. Well, <clears throat> Reverend William Barber, thank you so much for being with us, and be safe. Next up, we're heading to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to look at a shocking report about how two Ivy League schools, University of Pennsylvania and Princeton, have been using the bones of a child killed in the 1985 MOVE bombing, when the city bombed the house of the radical black group MOVE, killing 11 people, including five kids. How is it possible these bones have been used for decades? We'll get response from Mike Africa, Jr., a second-generation Born MOVE member. Stay with us. Yo no me canta cigarra que acabe tu son. Tu canto 
La Cigara by Afroyaki Music Collective, a tribute to political prisoners around the world. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. If you'd like to get our daily email digest, go to send the word Democracy Now!, one word, to 66866. That's Democracy Now!, text it to 66866. We turn now to shocking revelations that two Ivy League schools, the University of Pennsylvania and Princeton University, have been in possession of bones thought to belong to children who were killed in the 1985 police bombing of the Philadelphia home of the radical black liberation anti-police brutality group MOVE. In a minute, we'll show you video of the remains being used in an online teaching course and get response from Mike Africa, Jr. But first, we go back to that day, May 13, 1985, when the Philadelphia police killed six adults and five children, destroyed over 60 homes, burning an entire block to the ground by bombing the MOVE house. In a 2010 interview on Democracy Now!, Ramona Africa, the sole adult survivor of the 1985 attack, described what happened after the bomb was dropped on their house. In terms of the bombing, uh, after being attacked the way we were, first with four deluge hoses uh, by the fire department, and then tons of tear gas, and then being shot at, the police admit to shooting over 10,000 rounds of bullets at us in the first 90 minutes, um, there was a lull. You know, it was quiet for a little bit. And then, without any warning at all, two members of the Philadelphia Police Department's bomb squad got in a Pennsylvania State Police helicopter and flew over our home and dropped a satchel containing C-4, a powerful military explosive that no municipal police department has. They had to get it from the federal government, from the FBI. And without any announcement or warning or anything, they dropped that bomb on the roof of our home. Now, at that point, we didn't know exactly what they had done. We heard the loud explosion. The house kind of shook, but it never entered my mind that they dropped a bomb on us. But the bomb did, in fact, ignite a fire. And uh, not long after that, it got very, very hot in the house, and the smoke was getting thicker. At first, we thought it was tear gas. But as it got thicker, it became clear that this wasn't tear gas, that this was something else. And then we could hear the trees outside of our house crackling and realize that our home was on fire. And we immediately— tried to get our children, our animals, our dogs and cats, and ourselves out of that blazing inferno. It's Ramona Africa describing the police bombing of the Move House in Philadelphia in 1985. In November, the Philadelphia City Council formally apologized for the police bombing, which killed six adults and five children and destroyed the surrounding 60 homes. Memories of the attack that killed the 11 people were resurfaced last week, when the University of Pennsylvania and Princeton University acknowledged that for the past 36 years, anthropologists have been using the bones of at least one of the bombing victims, 14-year-old Trey Africa, in a video course posted online called Real Bones, Adventures in Forensic Anthropology, Penn Museum curator Janet Mong, a visiting Princeton University professor, holds bones thought to be of Tree Africa. The video is no longer available for public viewing, but anyone who already registered for the course can still access it. Democracy Now! obtained a copy from the Africa family. This is a clip. 
This is one of these cases where the material has some flesh on it, which I know is not uncommon, actually, in forensics and forensic anthropology. Uh, in this case, uh, there is some soft tissue, which is actually remaining, and the bones were actually burned as well. So it's got quite a complicated history. So I'll pick up just for a moment and show you that this is you know, really the, the tissue which is present on the specimen. It's not uh, a lot, but uh, absolutely it's there. This is the tendon that goes to uh, rectus femoris. It's actually intact, and it's there. The femur is um, uh, uh, with much less tissue associated with it, but you still have in the fovea capitis the anchoring ligament, which is present in the head of the femur. Uh, the bones are, uh, I mean, you know, we would say like juicy, you know, meaning that you can tell that they are of a recently deceased individual. They have a lot of sort of sheen to them, at least this one does. And that is uh, because, of course, there's still uh, marrow in the marrow cavity, and it's sort of leaching basically out and into the bone, so it gives that kind of slick sort of appearance. If you smell it, it doesn't actually smell bad, but it smells uh, just kind of greasy, like an older-style grease. Since this video was reported on last week, the Penn Museum <clears throat> and the University of Pennsylvania have apologized to the Africa family for allowing human remains recovered from the move house to be used for research and teaching and for retaining the re remains for far too long. The bones are reportedly now in the possession of Alan Mann, a professor emeritus at Princeton, who apparently received them from the Philadelphia Medical Examiner's Office for forensic analysis in 1985. Mann told the outlet Inside Higher Education he's working to return, quote, the upper end of a thigh bone and a small part of one pelvic bone to the examiner's office, and that he was, quote, sorry to learn that there's a perception that what I did with the move human remains was wrong, he said. The medical examiner's office has said that if the remains are returned to their office, they would attempt to locate next of kin to claim them. This controversy comes as the Penn Museum just apologized last week for holding more than 1,000 stolen skulls of enslaved people in its Morton collection. Samuel Morton was a 19th-century white supremacist researcher who directed workers to pull the bones from unmarked graves. For more, we go to Philadelphia, where we're joined by Mike Africa, Jr., a second-generation Born Move member and host of the podcast On a Move with Mike Africa, Jr. He's the co-author of the upcoming book, 15 Years on a Move, out next month. Mike, welcome back to Democracy Now! We offer you our condolences on this news about the remains of two Move children, it's believed, not only Tree Africa, but Delicia Africa as well. Can you explain how you found out about this um, and what you are demanding right now? Thanks for having me, Amy. Um, <clears throat> I found out about this because a friend called me and told me that they heard about it. And when they told me that I uh, was shortly after contacted by a, a local reporter who was about to uh, re uh, release a story about it. Hello? And that was uh, Mike, can you hear me? Uh, yes, hear go you. ahead, Juan. Uh, uh, Mike, I wanted to ask you, um, you knew uh, Tree Africa and Delicia Africa. You were friends with them. Could you, what do you remember about them? Um, you know, we spent years together uh, in, 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 uh, in, uh, in Virginia. See, back in the day, in, in the 70s, when the confrontational atmosphere in Philadelphia was, was extreme for MOVE, um, members of the organization, John Africa sent the children to um, a place in, in Virginia to get away from this confrontational atmosphere. So um, Tree and Delicia and many other children were, were sent there. And when I was born in the jail after um, 
after I was born, my grandmother took me to Virginia too to to be away from the crime and, and, and violence. And so we were there together for for years. And then uh, when the house in Virginia was raided too, and we were taken, all of us were put in an abusive orphanage where we spent 11 days with our hair being combed out of our scalp. Uh, some of us were pushed down steps. It was very, very abusive. And um, we were rescued from that situation, and we were brought back to Philadelphia, where we were reunited with other members of the organization. And we were living together. We were, we were always together. And then we, you know, we bounced around from house to house. All of us, all of us were, what well, I guess, unconventional orphans. Like we were all together because all of our parents were in prison. Tree's parent, mom, her mother, was in prison. Um, Delicia, both of her parents were in prison. Uh, and, of course, my parents were in prison, too. Delicia's father is Delbert Africa. He can, he's best known for the beating he took from police on August 8, 1978, where they kicked him and lifted him up off, off the ground with the blows to his body as he was on the ground trying to cover his defenseless body. Um, and so Tree and, and Delicia, I knew them both. Tree was the oldest of all the kids. Uh, she was very kind and she was very responsible and she was always being called on to help with the other kids because she was the oldest and Delicia was like she was like our little general you know she was like our our leader almost um a lot of things went through her as children a lot of things the decisions that were made the, the simple decisions like how to sneak some cooked food that we weren't really supposed to be eating you know came from her and she was um you know very 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 strong and and very clear visioned and um you know we had our own plans that we wanted to do when we got older and we talked about these things together and to know that this is happening now after all these years and we're so close to what happened may 13th another anniversary going by where we think about our family is is just devastating now i wanted to ask you uh I was a young reporter in at, in Philadelphia uh, during the 1985 move bombing. I was there that day, uh, most of the day spent with my good friend and fellow colleague at the Philadelphia Daily News, Lynn Washington, as we were covering that event. Uh, we were astonished as in the late in the afternoon, as we saw the helicopter that Pam Africa described, uh, described descending over the house suddenly dropping the bomb. And what astonished us most was not only the bomb and the fire, but that then the fire trucks, for more than an hour, do, would not turn any water on. It would let the house burn to force everyone out of the house. And then, of course, as they came out, we later learned police uh, attempted to shoot them down as the, uh, uh, as the people came out uh, of the burning house. I'm wondering your reaction to more than 30 years later, an apology by the Philadelphia City Council, but yet no one has ever been held accountable or was ever uh, indicted for what happened there that day. Yeah, you know, the, the apology came from a city councilwoman by the name of Jamie Gautier, who, who, who put that apology in because we asked, I asked her to. And I asked her too because, um, you know, there's there, there's still a lot of unresolved issues here with our family and close close members of our family, close supporters of our family who are still um, involved in these unjust situations. People like Mumi Abu Jamal, um, and and now that we found out that these 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 uh, that that the Penn and and Princeton have the remains of our family, it, you know, it, it, it makes you wonder what else do they have? What else are they covering up? What else are they lying about? I mean, to, to have an apology is valuable because that's kind of like an admission. And we're going to use that to, to, to flush out more, to, to prove the more injustices. And, you know, and the system is controlled by pressure. John Africa said the system is controlled by pressure. And if you don't keep the pressure on, they'll do whatever they want to do. Then they're not going to return the thousand uh, skulls that they have. They're not going to just stop killing people unless 
they are pressured and we have to find a way to to apply that pressure so um i don't think the apology is a bad thing i think it's a good thing this so and, and, <clears throat> Um, Mike, this so reminds me of Henrietta Lacks, the African-American woman whose cancer cells are the source of the HeLa cell line, the first immortalized human cell line, one of the most important cell lines in medical research. At the time that she was dying, she never knew they were using her cancer cells. Her family, for years, did not know this. And now we see that these bones of the children, um, of the MOVE bombing, one child, two children, as you said, you don't know what happened to the remains of the 11 people killed in the MOVE house. Then you also mentioned Mumia Abu-Jamal in prison for life in Pennsylvania. Um, we've just gotten word in the last days that he has survived um, serious open-heart surgery. Uh, do you know about his condition, that he has congestive heart failure, and what are the causes of this? Yeah, I mean, what's happening with Mumia's health situation it definitely is not just because he's 67 years old. You know, um, many members of the organization and other people that are victims of uh, the mass incarceration system in, in Pennsylvania and around the country are uh, they're, they're, they're coming down with all kinds of ailments and, and illnesses because of the treatment and the re and the um, and the way that the, the system itself is set up to give them poor medical con poor medical care and very, very low quality food, you know, so that that's just another issue. Uh, and that's why it's important to to expose these injustices so that we can use this exposure to 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 get the people arm the people with information so that the people can uh, use the information to pressure the system. Um, you know, we, we definitely want uh, an investigation. Uh, I, I as a as a as the as a collateral descendant of the, some of the people in the house May 13th. John Africa uh, was my grand uncle. And, you know, I, I don't trust the Penn Museum. I don't trust Princeton. Um, I, I definitely want to say that um, there's more to come with this. Uh, from my from my point of view, from where I'm standing, I, I feel that there needs to be done. Uh, there needs to be accountability because uh, the, the reaction, the, the people... Uh, Penn's reaction to this is, is is totally unprofessional. Making an apology through a statement through someone else, and you know the the whole thing is just is egregious. Uh, people are suffering and have been suffering for, for over thirty six years just because of the bombing. You're but, calling for the bones back. Um, the bones to the the children. We have five seconds. That will be decided by their parents. Mike Africa, I want to thank you so much. I'm Amy Given with Juan Gonzalez.